Now what I want to do is get into more of Spark Streams itself. So less focus on other types and more focus just on Spark Streams. So this diagram here, hopefully you guys can read this. Uh, font gets a little small because we're trying to pack so much information in. Um, worst case, take a screenshot or something and we'll, we'll try to help you if you need it, get this slide to you. All right, so in the current flow, this is pre-sparse stream. So think of this as just a mainline with a traditional development stream. What you do is you start with a, uh, a mainline, which is in the depot, and then you have a workspace view. You create that child stream. At this point, nothing happened because I didn't run what we call a populate step, okay? And we'll talk about that in P4V and I can uh, remind you what that means. But nothing, when you just create it, nothing actually happened. But in order to start working in that newly created uh, dev stream, you have to populate the stream. Okay, in a sparse stream, same flow where you create, you have a main line, it has files in it, Okay, and you got a workspace tied to that. But then when you create that child stream, again, instantaneous creation, but your workspace is gonna make it appear as though those files actually live in the workspace, okay? And it makes you think that the reason the files are there in the workspace is because they're there in the sparse stream. The, but the actual answer is they're not there in the sparse stream yet. No, Again, no metadata for any of these files has been branched into the new Spark stream. And so to the end user, they don't know any better and think, okay, I'm just gonna go work in my Spark stream and I see everything I expect to see. I can get to work, I can get started. And again, we didn't branch any file data or metadata to that new newly created Spark stream. Okay, so back to the current flow on the left-hand side. Again, in order for you to start using that stream, you got to run a populate command, okay? And when you do that populate, you're populating metadata for every single file in the main, in the parent stream, in this case, the main line, okay? So now dev one, in my very simplified example, has all three files branched into it. So the metadata for all three files is branched into that dev stream. However, in a sparse stream, again, we only branch when necessary. And so in this case, I took one of the three files, the readme file, and I opened it for edit. And when I did that, now you see in the dev one depot file here, uh, you see readme was actually branched into that namespace. And so again, in the end, I'm only gonna branch metadata into the sparse stream for files that I've actually opened for edit in that sparse stream, saving you metadata savings on the database. Okay, so hopefully that was a good overview of kind of the differences, again, current flow on the left of a traditional dev stream, and you could substitute uh, release for dev there with uh, the future side, which is the right side, which is, uh, in this case, a sparse dev stream, but again, you could just, just swap in your mind sparse rel for release, same exact flow. So hopefully that helped paint a picture of kind of how this is done uh, behind the scenes. And then let's talk about sparse streams in a little bit more depth here. So, in, uh, you know, in, in these next set of uh, slides here, you're going to see kind of that, hopefully it comes across as kind of a peach line at the bottom, which is the main line, um, a kind of a lime green, which is your sparse development stream, and then a light blue at the top, which is your client. Okay, so I just have a bunch of files here in my main line. Uh, you can see in this case, I've opened for edit the file name bar in the sparse dev stream, but to the client, it looks like it has everything because it knows where to get the file from, where to get the file revision from, okay? And if you look on the left here, this is an example of what your stream spec is gonna look like. So in this case, I the stream is in a, in a depot named Debo and the stream name is sdev, okay? Its type is sparse dev. Its parent is the main line. Now what's interesting is you see this line called share, which you're used to seeing, but now you see the dot, dot, dot at revision number, in this case, 100, just to be simple. This is, uh, we internally like to call it kind of like the pin, right? This is when you created that sparse dev stream, what was the latest revision sitting in the parent stream? In this case, it's 100. And then as I talked about, 
um, we use something called overlay views to make this happen. And so you can see the view, you see the parent, and then we're overlaying a view of the sparse dev stream itself. And that's <clears throat> how the clients know what it's syncing and what it's getting and the definition of the actual view itself of the stream. And then you similarly see a change view also calling out change 100 as being the revision of the parent um, at the time of creating the sparse dev stream. Now, one question you might have, can I change the pin on the sparse stream post creation? The answer is sometimes, okay? You can change it at post creation if there are no files in the sparse stream. So let's say you created the sparse stream and at the time the latest revision in the main line was 100 but now there have been 20 more changes submitted to the main line. So now the latest is 120 and you haven't done any work in your sparse dev stream yet. You could go in there and you could change that pin to 120 and we would accept that. However, the minute that you have at least one file branched into the sparse dev stream, you can no longer manually go change that pin. Okay. You can, the pin will get updated and we'll get to how it gets updated but it's no longer a manual update. Now it's a systematically controlled pin, okay? So hopefully that made some sense. All right, so let's go through a hypothetical example. Again, we're gonna use that share at 100 as the, what was the, uh, rev the greatest revision number in the mainline or in the parent in this case at the time of creating that sparse stream. And in here, what we're doing is saying, okay, I'm going to have a client of the sparse dev stream and I'm going to do a sync. Well, what it knows is I need to go sync from the parent at what revision 100. And so in this case, because there are no files that have been open for edit in the sparse dev stream, when you do a sync from the client, all of the file revisions are actually coming from the main line, which is the parent of the sparse dev. Again, using those overlay views. Okay, so and then where it starts to get a little interesting is now I'm going to open bar for edit. Okay, so now we branched bar into the sparse dev stream and bar itself has a revision number, which is greater than what's in the parent stream in the main line. But again, when you go do that sync from the client perspective, you're going to get foo at 100 from the main line. You're going to get zot at 100 from the main line. And then you're going to get bar at 120 from the sparse dev stream. Because again, your client is a sparse dev client. So it's getting a mix of files from the, from the main line and from the sparse dev. The client just, the magic just happens for the client. Okay. So that's how this works from a syncing perspective after you've at least branched one file into that sparse dev stream. Okay, now we're gonna actually go in and make an edit inside of that sparse dev stream to file bar. So now bar was previously branched from the main line. Now again, it was branched from 100. Uh, it became 120 in the sparse dev stream. Now I made an edit to that uh, file in the sparse dev stream. And so now it's revision 123. I forgot to call out in the main line here, you can see that other revisions have been created of all three files. And it doesn't matter to the client of the sparse dev stream, because again, that share pin simply says, all I care about is being pinned to version 100. So in this case, it just knows I always, whenever I'm getting something from the main line, which is the parent of the sparse stream, I'm gonna get it at revision 100. And then anything that's been branched into the sparse dev, I'm going to get whatever that latest revision is inside of the sparse dev stream itself. Okay, and then here's where it starts to get a little interesting, okay? Now, I'm actually going to integrate changes from the main line into the sparse dev stream. So in this case, what we're saying is, is merge down. Okay, when I merge down, I see that there is a new revision of bar available at uh, in the main line. And so I'm going to bring that down and it's going to make it version 130. 
of course, I've made some changes in, in the sparse dev stream itself. So I'm going to have some resolve work to do. Um, but what we know at this point is, is we're going to merge things down. We're going to do a resolve. And at that point, the next time we do a sync from the client, we're no longer pinned to 100. Now we're pinned to 129. Okay. 129 being right before we created that new revision in the sparse dev stream. So when I do my sync from the client, I'm actually going to now get foo at 112. I'm going to get bar at 130 and I'm going to get zot at 113. So I've updated the pin through doing a merge down from the parent stream into the sparse dev stream.